Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hello Harem podcast. I think this is like episode 20, 23. Um, so I'm all by myself today. Alex is feeling a little under the weather. Jonathan and Luke are not here as well. So you just get good old me talking today. And uh, some things I wanted to address right off the bat. Um, the past two weeks, there have not been episodes out. Um, the reason for this is because the first week we had um, we had recorded it and it was all done, but as we were like finishing up packing up here, we kind of decided amongst ourselves that it wasn't like good enough to put out. You know, uh, we weren't satisfied with the content, and it was just kind of all over the place. It wasn't really a good episode that you could really take anything away of. I mean, ideally, what I want people to get when they listen to this podcast is maybe some information, they learn something new, um, maybe you get a few laughs and just, uh, have a good time listening to it, but it was all over the place and it was it was just kind of bad, so we decided to scrap that, and um, the week after that, Jonathan had the idea of doing kind of a challenge thing for us, so um, since we missed a week, he was like, hey, we, I got this wheel, we can throw some things in it, and um, we'll kind of punish ourselves for it. And that, yeah, yeah, we'll just punish ourselves for it. So we got some uh, pretty good punishments, and we recorded it, and it was it was pretty good. I, you know, I had a fun time doing it. I think everyone else did. And it turned out to be a pretty good episode. But as we were done with it, I got a notification on my laptop saying that my storage was full. Um, I didn't think it would be an issue. It turned out to be an issue, so I went into my storage and I made plenty of space, emptied the recycle bin, and there was a ton of space. So it should have saved um, perfectly. But as I tried to save it, Mac decided to give me the spinning wheel of death, and that went on for a while. I mean, we left here. I had closed it, but I left the program open. I took it home, and like six hours later, I checked it again, and it was still giving me the spinning wheel. So I forced closed. Uh, the program and it got rid of the file completely and we lost it unfortunately so there was no episode because of that but what we are going to do is we decided to turn that episode of a podcast into a video because it's it's very visual heavy and if you watch it you can probably have a lot more fun with it other than just listening to it so I think that's going to be a lot more fun than just a podcast episode but again I do apologize for missing two weeks of the podcast you know we were we were on the ball we were consistent with it for quite a while and I was uh, I was very happy with it but like I said um, content wise it, the first one was just not something we were comfortable putting out as a podcast we want you guys to really get something out of it and we want you to enjoy listening to it and that was just not one of those things and unfortunately technical issues do happen and it did you just have to get past them and uh, we're, we're looking to the future now so like I said, I am all alone today. Nobody's here. I'm in an empty room with a camera, a mic, a laptop, and I'm just just hanging out. We're just having a good time. Um, some things? Uh, no. Uh, actually, what I wanted to do today is different than what we originally had planned. So Luke came over Monday night, and we kind of planned out what we were going to do for Wednesday. And today's Thursday, by the way. So Luke came over, and we were going to do cultural differences between the U.S. and Japan. And we had a lot of really good points for this, and I was super excited for this episode. But unfortunately, Alex got sick, and uh, the other two don't want to be here around someone who lives with the sick kid, right? Uh, it makes total sense. So I decided to just do this by myself, and I'm not going to go over cultural differences between Japan and the U.S. today. What I want with that episode is opinions, and I can get those from three other people, especially someone who's been to Japan before, like Alex. Um, Jonathan knows a good amount about Japan as well. Luke is, doesn't know too much, but he can definitely have an opinion about it, and he probably has things to add into the conversation. So what I wanted with that episode was a lot of learning. You know, I can, get some, I can learn stuff from it. Everyone here can learn stuff from it. Um, it would just be a good time with everyone else here. So what I decided to do today was something I had in my notes for a while ago. Today I'm going to be talking about Japanese yokai, mythology, 
folklore, stories, all that fun stuff. It's been in my notes for a little bit just sitting there, and uh, we just haven't gotten around to it yet because, I'll be honest, I don't know too much about Japanese mythology and folklore, um, although I do have a Japanese-themed sleeve tattoo. There's a big Hanya mask inked on my arm. I know not too much, you know. So I prepared for this today, and I learned quite a bit about different yokai, and holy shit, there's a lot of yokai. So we're not going to be able to cover them all today at all. So if you do have an interest in yokai, I definitely suggest going and checking them out on your own. There is a plethora of information on them, and just so many different types of yokai, and like evil ones, good ones. It's crazy how many there are out there. So I picked five for today that I want to go over. And there's a few other things that I wanted to bring up in this as well that we will hit. But let's, uh, let's, let's hop into this right now. I've got this up on my dock because there's a lot of information here. So basically, if you don't know what a yokai is, it's like a Japanese monster, pretty much. And it's a little... I guess the closest comparison you could do is to... Crypto, uh, not cryptozoology, cryptids, just cryptids in the U.S., like the Mothman, Bigfoot, the Jersey Devil. Uh, I don't know if would aliens be considered cryptids or not. Anyway, that is probably the closest you can compare it to here in the United States, just for a little bit of reference if you don't know much about yokai at all. But they are a little bit different in the sense of what I read today is some of them are kind of like parables. And if you don't know what a parable is, it is a story with a lesson in it, like man have fish, he give fish, everyone have fish, essentially. Not really, but you get the point. There's a story in the story, or a lesson in the story. And some yokai are like that. I don't know if all of them are. What I watched today, he said that a few of them were. The one we're going to hit on today is kind of like that. And I will go over that one. I'll let you know when that happens and when we're there. But the first yokai we're going to be going over today is the kasha. Now, the kasha is a, I guess it wasn't, it isn't fully determined. A lot of people think that it is a cat yokai, kind of, like a humanoid cat. So, uh, kasha are a yokai that would steal corpses from funerals and cemeteries, and what exactly they are is not firmly set. Like I said before, no one is fully, like 100%, yep, this is what that yokai is. And there are examples all throughout the country. In many cases, their true identity is actually a cat yokai. And it is also said that cats that grow old would turn into this yokai. And their true identity is actually a nekomata. Uh, I don't even know what a nekomata is. Let's see if we can find that. Nekomata. Nekomata um, are kinds of cat yokai described in Chinese and then Japanese folklore, classical, caden, essays, etc., there are two very different types, those that live in the mountains and are and domestic cats that have grown old and transformed. So basically just a, uh, a humanoid cat is what I'm picking up. However, there are other cases where the kasha is depicted as an oni carrying a damned in a cart to hell. Um, I'm not going to go into an oni yet because I do have oni on this list and we'll go a lot more into that. So just hang tight if you don't know what an oni is. There are tales of kasha in folk tale... Uh, Neko Danka, etc. There are similar tales in the Harima province uh, in Yamasaki, and there is tale of Kasha Baba. As a method of protecting corpses from Kasha, uh, where were we at? Where were we at? Um, the temples would hold two funerals, and what they would do at the first funeral is instead of putting the corpse in the, we'll say, casket, because I'm not exactly 100% sure how Japanese funerals are held. They would put a rock in the first casket and then seal up that. So when the kasha does come out to steal the corpse, it's actually stealing the rock and not the actual corpse itself, which is kind of cool. I thought that was, that was kind of neat to learn. Japanese folklore often describes the kasha as humanoid cat demons with the head of a cat and or tiger and a burning tail. They're similar to other demons such as Nekomata and Bakeneko and get often interchanged with them. Kashas are said to travel the world on burning chariots and baruches. I don't know what that is. Stealing the corpses of recently deceased humans which were not yet buried and who had been sinful in life. They bring their souls to hell. 
That that's actually interesting. I didn't know that. So basically, <clears throat> if you were a a shitty person or a bad person, the Kasha would steal your soul and bring you to hell for all damned eternity. That's pretty interesting. That's that's pretty cool. Um, but it doesn't seem like Kasha are very. Um, seems like as a human who is alive, you don't really have to worry about the Kasha too much. Just worry about them stealing the corpses of maybe your family or friends or anyone around you if you live by a cemetery. Um, bah, bah, bah. <clears throat> God. Uh, with the weather changing a lot, I'm getting like a, not, I don't really get allergies or anything, but ate before I came and if I eat too much, then it kind of messes with my sinuses. So that's what we're dealing with right now. It's a fun time. Uh, next, we will talk about the Mikoshi Nudo. This one's actually kind of cool. When uh, I read this, I had no idea. But I learned quite a bit about this one. It's very interesting. Um, I think it's kind of popular. Uh, if you see an image of it, you might recognize it and be like, well, you won't know what it's called, but typically you won't, unless you really know yokai. You'll see the image and be like, hey, I've seen that somewhere before. That's kind of how I felt about it. And uh, then I learned about it. So that's where we're at. When walking at the end of a road at night or hill roads, something the shape of a monk would suddenly appear, and if one looks up, it becomes taller the further one looks up. They are so big that one would look at them and thus are given the name Meiji Nyudo. Look up Nyudo. It's kind of what it's roughly translated to. Sometimes if one just looks at them like that, one might die, but they can be made to disappear by saying, Mikoshida, I've seen past you. They most frequently appear when walking alone on night paths, but they are also said to appear at intersections, stone bridges, and above trees. It is said that getting flown over by a Mikoshi Nyudo results in death or getting strangled by the throat. Not a fun way to go. And if one falls back due to looking at the Nyudo, one's windpipe would get gnawed at and killed. On Iki Island off Kyushu, a Mikoshi Nyudo would make a wada wada sound like the swaying of bamboo. So, by immediately chanting, I have seen past the Mikoshi Nyudo, uh, the Nyudo would be made to disappear, but it is said that if one simply goes past them without saying anything, bamboo would fall, resulting in death. In the Oda district, Okayama Prefecture, it is said that when one meets a Mikoshi Nyudo, it is vital to lower one's vision to the bottom of one's feet, and if one instead looks up at the head from the feet, one would be eaten and killed. Other than chanting Miko, Mikoshida or minu, Minuita, seen through, roughly translated, there are also examples where they would disappear by mustering one's courage and smoking tobacco. Uh, what I watched in the video today was basically the way to defeat a Mikoshi Nyudo is to anticipate it. Now, at first, that didn't like really click with me i was like how you just you just anticipate it you can't really like anticipate something like that but i guess it's if you're walking down a dark path in japan at night and you're the back of your mind is filling with maybe i'll see one maybe i won't you should probably stay on the maybe i will side because you're anticipating it to come and if you do you follow its head up you're you're gonna die so keep your head down and just I don't know, say, say I see past you is what it seems like. Uh, see, what I was talking about with the, the parables, actually, um, in the video said that today the Mikoshi Nudo is similar to a parable, whereas it was kind of made to warn travelers walking on dark paths at night to be wary of where they're at and what's around them so you know nothing bad could happen to you because there are dangerous animals in Japan, Um I don't know when this yokai actually was written or established or made canon, but maybe there's vehicles out that you might not see, or if it is dark, they might have a hard time seeing you. So be wary of your surroundings is pretty much what I'm getting out of this, which is, um, I'd say, a good thing to know, you know. Always be wary of where you're at, you know, be careful if you're in a new place or even a familiar place, just stay frosty. This next one is actually super, super cool. I really like this one. Let me just check the time. Okay. Yuki Ona. 
Yuki Ona originates from folklores of olden times in the Muromachi period by Renga Poet Sogi. There's a statement on how he saw a Yuki Ona when he was staying in Echigo province uh, in Niigata prefecture, indicating that the legends already existed in the Muromachi period. There's a beautiful ice demon. Um, pretty much how it is depicted is an ice woman. She's supposed to be super beautiful, long black hair, very pale skin, and she's depicted as wearing a white kimono. Oftentimes, uh, she's said to be floating, so she doesn't leave any footprints. There's also been versions where they say they might not have feet, so can't leave footprints if you don't have feet, I guess. But it is said that she can freeze you with just a touch. So if she touches you, you're frozen, and she kind of sucks the life form out of you. And her skin is super cold to the touch, so if you ever encounter a Yuki Ona, don't touch it. You're probably going to die. It is also said that occasionally the Yuki Ona would fall in love with one of her victims and make them her husband, which is, that's that's crazy. Just imagine you're in the mountains one day and you run into a Yuki Ona and you, uh, I don't know, a day later you're married to a Yuki Ona. But it is also said that when the husband kind of comes to and realizes then the Yuki Ona would go ballistic, go to neighboring villages and kill everybody and just not a good time. So don't fall in love with the Yuki Ona or else probably people are going to die. But what I found really interesting about this one is that she's just as depicted as a beautiful woman in the, the random mountains. So if you're just stumbling around in the mountains and you see this, this gorgeous girl out there, right, you're going you're gonna to be intrigued. You know, if it's like a regular yokai that looks scary as hell, your natural instincts are going to tell you to just get the fuck away. Like, run away, don't want any part of that. But this one is kind of, it has an alluring factor. You you kind of want to go investigate and see what's up, right? Because typically you don't see a beautiful woman in the mountains. You know, that's not something you see. Or, you know, you don't see terrible monsters either, but you're going to want to get the hell out of there if you do, because fight or flight, man, get out of there. Next one. Um, let's see. We are at the Kudo Bozu. This one's kind of weird. This one's a little creepy. Pretty, pretty. Uh, it's sketchy. The Kudo Bozu is a yokai from the folklore in the Meiji era. He looks like a black monk, but blurry to the human eye. Kudo Bozu would come into a woman's room when she is asleep and suck her breath or lick inside of her mouth to kill her. Essentially, the Kudo Bozu would kind of stalk somebody for days on end so it would pick its victim and it would only appear at night while they were sleeping so no one knew it was around and in fact you can't even really see it um a lot of depictions are of it kind of being a premonition very pale kind of ghostly so it's really hard to get a read on what it looks like exactly anyway so the kiraboza would sneak into your room and while you're asleep it would like lick your face and kind of suck the life force out of you and just you see, that's what I mean. It's kind of creepy. It's like licking a woman's face while she's asleep. And that's, that's fucked. Come on, Kiroboza. You're better than that. But it poisons you over time. And over that period, you're going to eventually end up dying because the Kiroboza selected you as its victim. Pretty interesting one there. And uh, we're going back. We're going on touching on the Onis now. So when I said before, we're going to hit on the Onis. We're here. Let's do this. A yoni is a kind of yokai demon, ogre, or troll in Japanese folklore. They are typically portrayed as hulking figures with one or more horns growing out of their heads. Stereotypically, they are conceived as red, blue, or white colored, wearing one cloth or tiger pelt, and carrying iron kanbo sticks. Kanabo sticks. Um, basically, oni are kind of like the thing you imagine when you think of yokai. It is the typical, what you would imagine is a mask. They have those protruding fangs that kind of go out in different directions. Like on my tattoo, even though this is a Hanya, it's sim very, very similar to an Oni. You have the protruding fangs on each side, horns, and it has this very aggressive demon-looking face. Uh, it is said that Oni are kind of, well, I don't want to say reincarnated, but they are the souls of people who were terrible on earth who died. So if I was a terrible person on earth and I died, my kind of soul would stay here as an oni and just wreak havoc and cause terror amongst people. And you can kill the oni. Uh, I don't know if there's any specific way or what they're kind of immune to. If you can just take them with a sword and then 
go for it. But I'm not sure about that. But I know they can be killed. If you kill an Oni, it is gone forever. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And one more thing I wanted to... Actually, I have the Hanya mask on here as well. But the there are two masks, I think, that are extremely popular in Japanese uh, folklore and just in general that a lot of people seem to know about. In my opinion, it's the Hanya mask and the Kisune mask. Now, the Hanya mask looks very similar to an Oni, but the Hanya mask is actually a jealous demon girl. Um, it looks very similar to an Oni. It's got the protruding fangs. But one interesting thing about the Hanya mask is it can change its emotion based on how you look at it. So if you watch a play, they're often used on actors. If the actor has their head staring straight at you, you're probably going to see a very angry-looking demon girl. But if they kind of angle their head down, and I don't know, left or right, but if it's in a down position, kind of angled away, it looks like the mask is like sad and in pain. I think that kind of plays on the the jealousy of it. You know, if uh, the girl's jealous, she's obviously going to be pissed off and uh, angry. But again, jealousy, I feel like also comes with some sadness. Like, you know, you've kind of lost or something like that. So I think it's cool how they can kind of get both of those mixed into this one mask. And uh, next was the Kitsune mask. Now, there's not like a ton of lore behind the Kitsune mask, um, although I do believe it is probably the most popular mask in Japanese culture, in my opinion. I see it all the time. It's very popular to be worn at festivals. Uh, Kitsune means fox, so it is a fox mask. You can really like buy them anywhere. You know, I was just Googling today, and I found some on Amazon I could get. But I want an authentic one, so when we go to Japan eventually, I'm going to pick one up there. Like I said, they're worn at festivals. And they're just kind of um, worn to show gratitude to the gods, really. Um, there's not much to them. They're they're just kind of playthings, kind of, which is oh, that's cool. I know I would. Uh, I still really want one. Now um, I'm going to take this kind of into the anime world with yokai and folklore and all that fun stuff. There's an anime called Toilet Bound Hanako Kun that. Um, plays on the the seven wonders of schools now to my knowledge the seven wonders oh oh geez um now to my knowledge the seven wonders are just the seven things that kind of all kids just kind of know about in school like if you were in school and there was a rumor about your school chances are you heard about it from like an upperclassman or something and I, i feel like that's how these kind of are they're just kind of passed down from class to class to class and they just make their way down and, I don't know, maybe make changes along the way. But they seem to be pretty pretty in their ways. Now, if these are, like, actually true, yeah, if anyone watches this and is in, like, Japanese school or attended one at one point or you know more about this, please let me know because I'm actually really curious about these. I can't find a ton of information on it. I might just not be digging hard enough, but pretty much what I picked up is just there are things in school that kids talk about that... uh Maybe they avoid. Maybe they actively try to do. So, again, the the show Toilet Bound and Hanako Kun is about these seven wonders. Uh, the main character, uh, I don't know if it's Nene or Hanako, either or, they're the two main characters. Nene goes into the girls' bathroom, and Hanako Kun is actually one of the seven wonders. Now, to kind of access Hanako Kun. Nene goes up to the third floor of the third bathroom. On the third stall, you knock and you ask Hanako-kun if he wants to play. Now, based on the legend, if you hear an answer, you're kind of boned. Uh, Essentially, it drags you into the toilet and you're gone for all eternity. So what you don't want is to hear an answer. If you get nothing, then you're okay. I guess you win the game or Hanako-kun just doesn't like you and wants to play with you. But... Nene does it, and Hanko Kun comes out, and they're they're buddies. Although um, I will say it is a fantastic anime, so if you haven't seen it, I highly suggest watching it. The art style totally blew me away with how different it was. It was way out there, and I had a really fun time watching it. Would definitely recommend it to anybody. Uh, I believe this is the, I think I went in backwards order here. I think I went from seven to six. So we'll go on to six. The God of Death. <clears throat> and uh, if I bring up the word boundary, boundary is just kind of the area on where these are found. 
I don't know if I have it on all of them, but this one, the boundary of number six is under the school. The boundary itself has water as its floor. As all other boundaries do, it seems to be larger than most seen in the series and contains many traditional style Japanese buildings connected by a series of bridges, as well as an abundance of flowers. The boundary as well contains a river that number six sailed through to bring Akane, uh, Akane Oi to the boundary to be sacrificed. The rumor begins with an event called Tsukimachi, where children gather together weaving baskets all night until sunrise. The children have to stay awake the whole night or their souls will attract the god of death. So what I'm picking up out of this is you, you got to stay up all night to get them to come out. Uh, maybe I'm reading that wrong, but that's what I'm getting out of it. So if you stay up all night weaving baskets, then the, the god of death will appear before you. That would be pretty spooky. Next, uh, what is this, number five? The 4 p.m. book stack. The book stacks have records of every student in the school uh, from the past, present, and in the future. It is said that white books are for living people and the black ones are for the deceased. Upon entering the book stacks, none of the rumored red books can be found, but in the books, the future is marked with a red page. Now, I've got all these. Um, I'm getting all these from the Hanako-kun lore. So this is all from, I, th I think, the manga or the, I don't know if it's a light novel or manga. But all the ones that I'm reading right now are from Hanako-kun. So these will probably be portrayed in the anime. So if you watch that, you might be able to pick up on some of these. And the 4 p.m. book stack can be found in the library. That would probably make the most sense. Now, I don't think I saw this one in the show. Uh, it didn't go over all seven yet, unless it's getting another season, which I really hope it is. It'll probably cover more. So I didn't know much about this one. Uh, Shijima-san of the art room. Shijima Mei is capable of creating pictures or picture worlds that reflect wishes deep within people's hearts. Once you've been pulled into a world, you'll have to follow her words or you'll remain trapped. The longer you stay in the fictional world, you'll slowly forget about your original life. In order to escape, you'll have to find main characters in the fictional world and kill them. That's actually kind of, that would be spooky. So the longer you're there, the longer you forget about your own life and you kind of become one with the artwork. And the only way to get out is to kill fictional characters. Or no, you'll have to find the main characters in the fictional world and kill them. That's, huh, spooky, spooky. Uh, it did say there were spoilers in there, so... Just a heads up. Again, I don't know. What is this? That was... One, seven, six, five, four, three, two... Yeah, three. Three, number three. The Hell of Mirrors. This one was actually in the show, so if you watch it, you'll kind of get this one. The third mystery's representative has the ability to reflect the hearts of those who wandered inside it. Those who are pure of heart will be able to escape without trouble. Otherwise, the mirror will change its appearance to reflect one's deepest fear beckoning its victim to stay forever. It tortured Nene by telling her that she was... <laughs> it tortured Nene by telling her that she had radish legs, or in the show they call her daikon legs. Poor Nene, man. She gets it too much. For those without memories, the mirror appears blank. The school mystery desires to trade places with the living, allowing the mannequin who manages to capture the human soul to replace them. So if you're in here, and you have some uh, a dark past... You're in for it, buddy. So, if you're ever in a Japanese school and you want to uh, encounter the Hell of Mirrors, make sure you're a pretty good person before you do, or else you'll stay there forever. Sucks to be you. What is this number two? The Misaki Stairs. The rumor describes a world that can be entered by stepping on the fourth step of the stairs. The story goes that once you enter this world, your body will be torn into pieces. During twilight, you can see the blood of the victim stripping from the fourth step of the stair. Now, when I was learning how to count in Japanese, oh, I feel like a toddler saying that, but I would always say um, she, which is four, like ich, ni, san, she. So Alex told me one day that she was kind of considered not rude. I feel like that's, that's too harsh of a word. More bad luck. Like the number 13 in elevators, if you ever go in an elevator, um, the 13th floor is usually never there. It goes from 12 to 14. So keep an eye out for that next time. He's, I think he said that's kind of how this is. So I stopped saying she and started saying yon, which is another way of saying four. 
And uh, I asked him this because this was in the show, and I saw it. I'm like, hey, they're making, like, the number four a big deal. What's up with that? And he's like, yeah, it's uh, it's weird, you know. So I started saying yawn now, and I count. And the last of the seven wonders are the clock keepers. Consisting of three keepers, the past, present, and future are able to control time. If you mess with the hands on the big clock, the keepers will appear before you and steal time from your life. So the gist of this is don't fuck with time or the timekeepers will fuck with you. Pretty good way to put it. Although no one can mess with time yet. Waiting for the day we get um, time travel. That would be pretty neat. I don't know. There's a lot of things with time travel, um, like paradox wise, that just fuck with me. Like, I don't know if you guys know about the grandfather paradox. It's like if you had the ability to travel back in time and you killed your grandfather so your dad wasn't born. Therefore, you could never travel back in time to kill your grandfather. So it would be... I don't, it just messes with my head, man. Like, I think about that, and it just goes in circles. Unless, like, your grandfather had your dad, and then you went back to kill him. But I don't know, like, but the, I don't know if that would alter the future to where you were still never born. You know, that there's so many hypotheticals you can throw in with that. But the grandfather paradox really uh really boggles my mind. There's no way around it. Either way, last thing I kinda wanted to touch on today was um one of my favorite folklore tales from Japanese culture. It is the story uh story. It is the story of Lady Kaguya. Uh I think this is what did I just watch? Uh Non Non Biori, yeah, they actually brought this up. They were out in the mountains, and they were cutting bamboo shoots. And Renge was too afraid to cut the... No, no, no. What was her name? The little... uh, She's the eighth grader, but she's really short. She told Renge to be careful of the bamboo shoots, or else you're going to cut into somebody's home. And Renge wouldn't cut the bamboo shoots, so she was knocking on all of them, saying, like, is anyone home? Making sure Lady Kaguya wasn't there. So this is actually one of my favorite... Uh, folklore stories from Japan, and I'm going to read it, just a quick synopsis of it for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the story. A bamboo cutter named Sanuki no Miyatsuko discovers a miniature girl inside a glowing bamboo shoot, believing her to be a divine presence. He and his wife decide to raise her as their own, calling her princess. The girl grows rapidly, earning her the nickname Takenoko, Little Bamboo, from the other village children. Tsutemaru, the oldest among Kaguya's friends, develops a close relationship with her. Miyatsuko comes upon gold and fine cloth in the bamboo grove in the same way he found his daughter. He takes these as proof of her divine royalty and begins planning to make her a proper princess. He relocates the family to the capital, forcing the girl to leave her friends behind, and the family moves into a mansion replete with servants. I don't know what that word means. kind of want to find out. I'll wait. The girl is soon saddled saddled with a governess who is tasked with taming her into a noble woman. The girl struggles with the restraints of nobility, yearning for her prior life in the countryside. When the girl comes of age, she is granted a formal name of Princess Kaguya by a name father, Miyatsuko, then holds a celebration where Kaguya overhears partygoers ridiculing her father's attempts to turn a peasant girl into a noble through through money. Bleh. Gotta learn how to read here. Kaguya flees the capital in despair and runs back to the mountains, seeking Sutemaru and her other friends, but discovers that they have all moved away. She passes out in the snow and awakens back at the party. Kaguya grows in beauty, attracting suitors. Five noblemen attempt to court her, comparing her to mythical treasures. Kaguya tells them she will only marry whoever can bring her the mythical treasure mentioned. Two suitors attempt to persuade her with the counterfeits. The third abandons his quest out of cowardice, and the fourth attempts to woo her with a flattering lie. When the last suitor is killed in his own quest, Kagi becomes depressed. Eventually, the emperor takes notice to Kagi's beauty and tries to kidnap her, but she foils him and convinces him to leave. Kagi reveals to her parents that she originally came from the moon. Once a resident there, she broke its laws, hoping to be exiled to earth so that she could experience mortal life. When the emperor made his advances, she silently begged the moon to help her. Having heard her prayer, the moon restored her memories and said she will be reclaimed during the next full moon. 
Kagi confesses her attachment to Earth and her reluctance to leave. Miyatsuko swears to protect Kagi and begin turning the mansion into a fortress. Kagi then returns to her home village and finds Sutemaru. The two profess their love for one another and their joy. They leap into the air and fly over the countryside, only to encounter the moon and fall. Sutemaru wakes up alone and reunites with his wife and child, interpreting the whole experience as a dream. On the night of the full moon, a procession of celestial beings led by the Buddha descends from the moon, and Miyatsuko is unable to stop it. An attendant offers Kagi a robe that will erase her memories of Earth. She is granted one last moment with her parents before an attendant drapes the robe around her, appearing to erase her memory. They leave, and Miyatsuko and his wife are distraught. Kagi looks back at Earth one last time and cries silently as she remembers her mortal life. I think it's a very, uh, a very interesting story, you know, very heartbreaking kind of, you know, this girl, uh, falls in love with how Earth is, and she's forced to go back, and her memories are erased, but her parents still remember her, so they know all about Kaguya. Well, guys, I know it was a short episode today, but I'm all by my lonesome. I've talked to you about Yokai, Seven Wonders, and Lady Kaguya. So I hope you are well knowledged in yokai now. I hope you carry on and tell the story of Lady Kagi to your children. And I hope you um, don't encounter any of the seven wonders in a Japanese school if you ever stumble upon one. And with that, I will make my leave. So thank you everyone for listening and tuning into the podcast. Uh, we will keep our consistency up and we definitely want to put out good content for you guys to enjoy. So everyone stay safe out there. You know, stay safe. It's dangerous. It's getting bad out there, especially in the U.S. Anywhere else, just stay safe. So thank you guys. Make sure to follow the podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, Anchor FM. And remember, we do post these live visuals over to YouTube, and we have other videos over there as well, like Japan Crate. There's more stuff coming out all the time, so make sure you're up to date and posted by subscribing to the YouTube channel. So thank you, and I hope you guys have a wonderful night. This has been Anthony on the Hello Harm Podcast, tuning off.